Hello everyone, this is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, an introduction to tools and techniques for mobile network testing, presented by Rodian Schwartz. Our presenter today is Paul Denisowski, Applications Engineer at Rodian Schwartz. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Paul. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Paul Denisowski, and I'm an Applications Engineer at Rodian Schwartz. Uh, over the last few years, we've developed and delivered a large number of technical webinars on topics related to mobile network design, optimization, troubleshooting, uh, optimization, topics such as LTE network troubleshooting, Volte, carrier aggregation, direction finding, my personal favorite interference hunting, et cetera. Uh, at Rodian Schwartz, we work very closely with our network operator customers, and therefore we place a lot of importance on co contributing practical information that's useful to technicians and engineers working in the real world, so to speak. And one of the ways that we do this is we will present people with actual data and actual measurements that we collected out in the field, and the question usually follows that, well, how did you make these kind of measurements? Or what kind of tool or instrument did you make this measurement with? Or what is the best tool for testing X, Y, or Z? Or I guess more generally speaking, what kinds of tools are available for testing the different activities in mobile network commissioning, testing, and troubleshooting? This webinar was created to address some of these questions, namely, what kinds of tools and techniques can be used for different kinds of testing? Of course, I'm sure it will come as no surprise that Rodian Schwartz offers a wide range of instruments that can be used for testing mobile networks. It would be kind of hard for us to help our customers otherwise, but like all of our webinars, our purpose here is really to talk about techniques and technologies, troubleshooting, and best practices, not about specific products or capabilities. We'll start the webinar with an overview of what exactly we mean by tools and techniques with regards to testing and troubleshooting mobile networks. As most of you know, there are different phases or tasks that are involved in running a mobile network. And as you might imagine, the tools and techniques needed for each phase are somewhat different. Although there's no standard way of naming these different phases, I'm going to break them down into four main categories, namely site installation and commissioning, RF, radio frequency that is, measurements, coverage measurements and optimization, and again, my personal favorite, interference hunting. We'll end with some general observations and maybe even a few predictions for the future, and we should also have time for some live question and answer at the end. So without further ado, let's start off by going into a little bit more detail about what we mean by steps in mobile network operation. To be perfectly honest, I'm not entirely happy with the title of this slide. I tried different words, phrases, segments, uh, phases, segments, et cetera. But the general idea here is that installing, turning up, and running a mobile network uh, involves different tasks at different times. I'm going to divide this into four main areas. The first of these I'm calling site installation and commissioning. This is where we create a new site, uh, turning up a base station. However, as we'll see, a site is not always synonymous with a traditional base station. Uh, this step would also include cases where a site may have previously been physically present, but was used for a different technology or was used at a different frequency. For example, if I convert an old GSM or IDEN site into an LTE site. The second step is what I'm calling RF measurements. Once the site hardware is in place and we turn the power on, there are a number of things we need to test and measure. Uh, aside from the somewhat obvious question, hey, is the site on the air? We typically want to measure things like how much power the site is transmitting, whether we're staying within our defined spectral limits, and other RF-based measurements, potentially including the actual demodulation of the signals themselves. Once our site is on the air or up and running, whatever you want to call it, what we usually care about most is performance. What kind of coverage do we have? It's important here, I think, that we understand that there are really two definitions for the word coverage. The more common and the more obvious one is coverage in a geographical sense. Over what geographical area are users able to connect to and utilize our network? Actually, geographical also probably isn't really the best word here, since in many cases the coverage is indoors or over a very small area, maybe in a sporting event or an entertainment venue. The second meaning I'm going to assign to the word coverage is the level of performance that users obtain, things like throughput, drop call rate, etc. There's a tendency on the part of subscribers to use these terms interchangeably. You hear things like, man, my video keeps freezing. The coverage here is really bad. And as many of you probably already know, there's sometimes very little correlation between geographical coverage and performance coverage. I can have five bars, excellent geographical coverage, and have really, really poor throughput or bad performance coverage. And for those of you who have attended some of our other webinars, you've probably already guessed that interference hunting is also an important activity when it comes to the operation of mobile networks. Even if you've done everything else right in terms of turning up the site, making measurements, optimizing your coverage, et cetera, it's all pretty much for naught if there's substantial external interference that can only be resolved by tracking down and shutting down the source of that interference. 
Uh, conversely, we also need to keep in mind that it's really all too easy sometimes to blame poor network performance on interference when, in fact, no such interference exists. Being able to either find an interferer or, conversely, to rule out the possibility of an external interferer is a, an important part of network operation as well. Now, even though I'm presenting these steps as a kind of start-to-finish list, the truth of the matter is that all these steps are cyclical. Most likely, you'll continue to turn up new sites or convert older sites on a regular basis. Uh, you'll want to measure things such as channel power or do demodulation of your signals either on an ongoing basis or whenever changes are made to the site or changes are made to the network. For better or for worse, coverage measurement is kind of the job that never ends. Now, testing the performance of the network and finding areas for further improvement and optimization are some of the most critical activities in cellular network operation. And, of course, interference will always be with us, although this step, differ, this step really differs from the others in that it's primarily reactive rather than being proactive. Note too uh, that a site, or what I'm calling a site here, might be outdoors, our traditional macro cell tower type site, or indoors, such as a DAS or a small cell installation. In any case, the steps in troubleshooting or going through no mobile network operation development are pretty much the same. One of the challenges, I think, in working in RF is that we as human beings are not able to directly sense radio frequency energy. Uh, well, you know that's really not entirely correct. I mean, there are certain power levels at which your body can directly sense radio frequency energy. I'm sure some of you know this from personal, perhaps painful experience. But let's just say that under normal conditions, we have to rely on instruments for testing and measuring radio frequency signals. Notice that I said instruments. As much as many of us would like to have a single instrument to meet all of our testing needs, this is unrealistic and impractical for a number of reasons, not the least of which are things like complexity, size, weight, and, of course, cost. Uh, that said, there are many cases in which we can use the same instrument for different tasks, depending on how that instrument is configured. We'll cover the different types of instruments that can be used for various tasks in a mobile network, as well as cases in which we can leverage one instrument for multiple tasks. The mobile networking world is really no different from many other disciplines in that you can't underestimate the need to have the proper tools for the task. In the course of my fieldwork, I have come across uh, very many people who have come up with some very novel ways uh, to perform their testing and troubleshooting when they don't have access to the proper tools or instruments. For example, I have seen people trying to do interference hunting and direction finding with everything from ancient desktop spectrum analyzers to those little portable bug detectors you see for sale on eBay. Uh, granted, there are a few engineers out there, uh, if you're attending this webinar, you probably know who you are, uh, who can be reasonable success, reasonably successful doing interference hunting with an AM radio and a wire coat hanger. But in 99% of the cases, not having the proper tools ends up costing you much more in the long run in terms of time and effort and, frankly, cost. So let's start up talking about tools during, used during site commissioning and installation. When I originally started working on this slide, I used the word base station installation and commissioning, but after giving it a little thought, I realized that I was thinking in terms of the old network architectures, defined in terms of towers and large footprint base stations, where a single set of antennas are co-located with a uh, base station controller. But as we know, many recent base station deployments don't really fit this older model of a base station feeding a single set of antennas on a big tower high up in the air. Instead, we have things like distributed antenna systems, small cells, etc. So after a bit of soul searching and, and consulting a thesaurus, I decided to call these sites. A, a site here being really any specific infrastructure designed to provide mobile network service to subscribers. That said, the measurement and testing tasks associated with site installation and commissioning are still more or less the same, regardless of the form factor of the installation. That is, we still need to measure antennas, whether they're eight foot tall antennas on top of a tower, or a six-inch panel antenna located in the ceiling of an office. Uh, distance default or cable length measurements can be made up that 150-foot vertical run to the top of a tower or 25 feet horizontally through a plenum space in a building. The tools and techniques remain, for the most part, the same. So what kinds of measurements would we normally want to make and what kind of instruments would we need? I've listed here what I consider to be the four most important tasks when it comes to installation and commissioning, namely antenna analysis, distance default or cable length measurements, they're related, passive intermodulation or PIM measurements, and what I'm somewhat generically calling filter and amplifier measurements. One common characteristic of all of these tests is that they're active tests. What I mean by this is that they all involve generating some kind of RF signal uh, 
and some kind of known RF signal and measuring the response. For example, we analyze antennas by sending RF into them and then seeing how much comes back. We measure cables by sending RF signals into them and seeing how long it takes the signal to come back. Uh, PIM tests involve generating two often fairly powerful signals and measuring both filters and amplifiers also requires that we send RF energy into the device under test. And this is again what I mean by these all being active tests. We'll go into more details about these tests on the next few slides. I'm going to make a somewhat bold statement here and say that antennas are really the most important piece of hardware in a mobile network site. Why? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, at the risk of maybe stating the obvious, antennas are the means by which conducted radio frequency signals are converted into radiated signals and vice versa. If the site antennas are installed incorrectly or if they're damaged, this can severely limit the performance or even prevent the site from working at all. So one of the first tasks that we want to undertake when turning up and testing a mobile site is to test that the antennas are working properly, and not just that they're working properly, but they're working optimally. It's important to avoid the temptation to say, well, you know, I see signals coming from the site, the antennas must be okay. The relatively small amount of time and energy that you would need to spend in testing antennas really will save you a lot of time and energy later on, especially if you have performance-related issues at the site. The positioning or orientation of an antenna in azimuth, that is horizontally, and elevation vertically or tilt, can have a very significant impact on the coverage that we obtain at a given site. But what we're discussing here is more of a physical RF layer analysis of the antenna. Is it working properly? How well does it radiate, regardless of orientation, et cetera? It's a little bit pointless to try adjusting the tilt of an antenna when the antenna doesn't radiate properly in the first place. So you can understand the priority that here we need to place on first making sure the antenna is working properly and then worry about if it's positioned correctly. Likewise, we can sometimes work around some interference issues by changing the way that the uh, antenna points, changing the tilt, for example. But it's worth noting that a damaged or defective antenna can also generate interference, and we've seen this on many occasions. Again, I really think it, it behooves you before you start talking about RF measurements or over-the-air measurements to really make sure that your antennas are in good working order in the first place. Okay, it begs the question, how do we analyze an antenna? Let's start by thinking about what exactly an antenna is designed to do. Namely, it converts radiated RF into conducted RF and vice versa. In the case of an antenna we're using for transmitting signals, what we really want is for all of the energy that we send into the antenna to be radiated out. Radiated out and for none of the energy to be reflected back at us. As you can imagine, we can therefore test an antenna by injecting a signal at certain, or signals at certain frequencies into the antenna and measuring how much of that signal is reflected back to us. Again, remember that the less that's reflected back to us, the better. The instrument that we use to do this is something called a network analyzer. Network here being, in my mind, a somewhat confusing and counterintuitive way of referring to a device under test, which has one or more input or output ports. Now, obviously, injecting a signal into the cable side of the antenna only measures the transfer performance of the antenna. It doesn't really measure the received performance. Although there are ways of directly measuring the received performance of an antenna, most often we simply rely on the happy coincidence that the transmit and received performance of an antenna tends to be strongly correlated. An antenna which transmits well at 750 megahertz will usually also receive pretty well at 750 megahertz. However, an antenna that works well at 750 megahertz probably doesn't work quite as well at 710 megahertz and may not work at all, at least in practical terms, at 1900 megahertz. Like everything else in life, antenna design involves certain compromises and trade-offs. And what this means is that antennas tend to be matched, that is, they work well, over somewhat narrow frequency ranges. Putting the wrong or an incorrectly matched antenna on a site is an excellent way to get really, really bad performance out of your system while the system still appears to be working, at least to some extent. A good habit to be in is testing antennas out of the box, and then again after they've been installed at the site. I mentioned before that placement of the antenna and the locations of nearby objects can have a non-trivial impact on the overall performance of an antenna. Um, but large deviations between the measured and manufacturer specs, or large changes between the pre- and post-installation values, usually merit further investigation. The antenna should still perform roughly the same when it's on the tower as it did when you took it out of the box on the ground. Note that while I refer to using a network analyzer to test antennas, most portable spectrum analyzers also have a built-in tracking generator and bizwire bridge that allows them to also be used as network analyzers, especially for this particular application.
Here's an example of an antenna measurement made with a portable network analyzer. The analyzer in this case would generate a relatively low level signal into the antenna. And then we look at the amount of power, the magnitude coming back. The signal is typically swept in frequency over a given range, here are about 700 to 800 megahertz, to see at what frequencies the antenna performs best, and which on this diagram looks like about 755 megahertz. Most commonly, the results of antenna measurements are given either in terms of visoire, the voltage standing wave ratio, or magnitude. Visoire, as the name implies, is a ratio of the maximum and minimum voltages on an antenna feed line whereas magnitude shows how much of the reflected energy is attenuated. Normally, we want a visoire value that's as close to one as possible, one being ideal. Or conversely, we'd like magnitude values that are as great or most negative as possible over the operating frequencies of the antennas. Again, it's very important when you install antennas, antennas to make sure that you sweep the antenna and that the performance of the antenna is what you can expect. I have personally seen cases in which an antenna was supposed to work at a certain band and it was actually the antenna for a completely different band. One of my favorite personal sayings is that there are a lot of wires and wireless, and mobile networks are certainly no exception. Most importantly, in most cases, there is some physical separation between the antennas and the device powering them, the base station controller, amplifier, etc., uh, and cables are used to connect these two together. Cables sometimes arrive from the manufacturer with certain damage or defects, or faults can be introduced during installation. Uh, Post-installation faults are also not uncommon. Cables can be damaged by weather, etc. I've personally seen cables damaged post-installation by animals and humans, sometimes humans shooting at animals, etc. Unfortunately, damage to cables is not always easy to determine by visual inspection. Sometimes due to the location of the cables, on way up high on a tower or within a wall or a ceiling, etc. And sometimes due to the cable sheath itself, the cable can externally look fine and internally have faults in it that cannot be seen by visual inspection. One of the ways to test the proper condition of a cable, I would say the best way to test it, is by running what is often called a distance default measurement. Here again, we're running an active test using a network analyzer or a simil similarly equipped spectrum analyzer, and this involves sending a short pulse of energy into one end of the cable and measuring how long it takes that pulse to return, either from the normal end of the cable, um, that is the, the far end of the cable, or from a damaged or defective location in the cable. This is also tremendously useful in determining the rough location of the fault for repair purposes. Uh, in many cases, it's more economical or easier to splice a cable rather than to have to redo or rerun the entire cable run. Normally, we test distance default again using the same type of instrument that we use for antenna measurements, so we can leverage the same network analyzer type equipment for both. Conducting a distance default measurement usually requires that the user provide some information about the type of cable. This is because the speed of light varies with cable type. Um, as well, I'm sorry, speed of the signal, not speed of light, varies with the cable type, as well as frequency and expected length of the cable. Let's take a look at an example of this. Distance default measurement results are normally displayed as a graph, optionally also as a table, in which we see the level of the return signal as a function of distance. The idea here is that larger reflections are due to larger imperfections in the faults or in the cable, so the peaks in the graph correspond to what I'm going to call locations of interest. I say locations of interest because not all peaks in a distance default graph necessarily represent true faults in a cable. For example, we could have a connector, a splice, a good splice, etc. And these will normally create a larger return level than straight undamaged cable. But in most cases, the amplitude of this return is still below that required for something to be considered a fault per se. And again, typically when we run distance default measurements, we define that reflections above a certain level quantify as are, are considered to be faults or not faults. Uh, I should probably also note here that like antenna measurements, it's a really good idea to run these distance default type measurements on your cables both before and after you install them to see if any faults or other issues were introduced either during the installation process or perhaps you got some faulty cable. Again, I've seen both happen in the field. It only takes a few minutes if you have the right instrument. It's definitely worth the time and effort to run distance default measurements both before and after installing cables. Another type of active testing, again, that's done on mobile network sites during site installation and commissioning is PIM testing. Many people associate PIM testing with interference hunting, since in some cases the source of interference is in fact PIM. But I've decided to include it in this section since, unlike most interference hunting activities, 
PIM testing, like all the other measurements here, is an active test that involves generating RF signals and measuring the effect that these signals have on the device under test. But I'm kind of getting a set up ahead of myself here. Uh, what is PIM? Well, PIM stands for passive intermodulation, which means that two signals mix together or intermodulate in a device and generate additional undesired signals, which may cause interference. The idea of mixing two signals to get these sum and different signals is a fundamental concept in RF, and um, our, none of our RF modulation would work without it. Uh, PIM works in exactly the same way as the active mixers that we do find in all kinds of RF devices, such as cell phones and base stations themselves. What makes PIM different, different is that instead of occurring in an active or powered mixer, something that has electricity going to it, the mixing occurs in a passive, that is non-powered device, and the classic of example of this being the rusty bolt. One often hears PIM referred to as the rusty bolt effect. PIM can be a very difficult problem to track down because almost anything metallic can act as a passive mixer, such as a rusty bolt. And there are lots of pieces of metal around a typical base station. So using a PIM tester can be helpful in determining if there are any components that are generating these undesired intermodulation products. Passive intermodulation or PIM testing, like all the other measurements that we mentioned before, is an active test in the sense that we use a PIM tester to inject, to generate two signals into the system under test. Now, these two system signals are known configured frequencies. Let's just call them F1 and F2. And by doing a little bit of math, the tester can compute where the intermodulation products will occur. We're normally only concerned with the odd order intermodulation products, that is, things the third, the fifth, the seventh, et cetera, order, because the, the results of these products will typically fall closest to F1 and F2, the original signals used. As mentioned before, PIM testing can be done during the installation and commissioning phase of a base station, uh, during troubleshooting, et cetera. Keep in mind that most PIM testers are limited in the frequency range that they cover, meaning you may need a separate PIM tester to test different frequency bands. Power output is also an important consideration when it comes to PIM testing. Relatively large amounts of power may be needed when testing PIM in an outdoor or a macro environment, let's say on the order of tens of watts, whereas indoor small cell type PIM testing may reveal issues even when using much lower power levels. Uh, to be perfectly honest, in my own experience, I have yet to see significant PIM issues indoors, um, but it's always worth taking a look if you um, think that there might be a possibility of PIM. One final note, although PIM is not really an uncommon issue in mobile networks, one should really try to avoid the temptation to blame all or most, many, performance and interference issues on PIM. I've seen many cases where difficult or hard to diagnose issues were simply written off as being due to PIM. Oh, can't figure out what the problem is, it must be PIM. When in fact, further investigation showed that these issues had causes that were completely unrelated to passive intermodulation. In a perfect world, there'd be no need for filters. Um, signals would stay in their assigned frequency ranges. Receivers would only respond to signals inside of their nominal receive ranges, et cetera. But as we all know, we don't live in a perfect world. And filters are a very common and very necessary part of operating and testing mobile networks. Base stations typically will use filters to reduce the impact of signals outside of their nominal spectrum allocations, outside of their band. So verifying that these filters are working properly is an important task as well. Ideally, we would like a filter which has little to no attenuation or rejection of signals within the passband, um, but very high attenuation of signals outside of that passband, very high being 40 to 60 decibels, uh, be a common number. Do keep in mind that filters don't block signals. Filters attenuate signals. So a sufficiently powerful signal will still be passed through a filter, although at a much lower level. The other important application of filters is when using test and measurement equipment or instruments. Like all other receivers, test and measurement equipment can be overloaded or saturated by high signal powers at nearby frequencies. So in some cases, a filter is placed on the input of a portable spectrum analyzer, for example, or monitoring receiver in order to avoid distortion in measurements. I'll point out here that what we're really trying to prevent is inaccurate measurements, not equipment damage. If the RF levels are so high that they could physically damage your instrument over the air, uh, they're probably damaging you too. There's no, the need for filters is, however, especially high when it comes to technology such as LTE. Uh, LTE has a much higher peak to average power ratio than previous generations of cellular technology. And in many cases, you can have multiple transmitters, for example, MIMO systems or closely spaced bands, I'm thinking of 700 megahertz here. Uh, which create a lot of RF power in a relatively narrow range of spectrum. Uh, 
Here again, what we also would like to do is to test our filters to make sure that they're suitably matched to the measurement task at hand. And in the case of a tunable filter, that we've adjusted the filter properly. Amplifiers are kind of the opposite of filters in that they're designed to raise instead of lower the level of incoming signals. Tower mounted amplifiers, TMAs, have traditionally been used to amplify the relatively weak levels of incoming signals before passing them on. This is particularly important in the case of towers with long cable runs. Uh, there's a lot of attenuation between the antenna on the top of the tower and the ground. Amplifiers are unlike filters in that they're active devices and require power. So if we want to make measurements on an amplifier or measurements on a system that's using an amplifier, the amplifier must be powered. Normally, DC power is provided to an amplifier over the connected RF cables. So for amplifier measurements, you would need an instrument that can provide this kind of power by means of something called a bias T or similar. And just like filters, amplifiers can be used both on the base station and on test equipment. For example, low noise amplifiers, LNAs, are sometimes attached to antennas when using instruments for interference hunting and other measurement tasks. Now, my personal experience has been that in most interference hunting scenarios, an LNA doesn't really add a tremendous amount of value. If the signal is so weak that you need an LNA to see it, it usually isn't much of an interferer. Using an LNA on an instrument or analyzer also does come with certain risks, ranging from introducing, introducing say, additional distortion to the possibility of equipment damage, depending on the level of amplification provided by your LNA. If you do use an LNA on an instrument, please be sure that you know and stay within the power limits of that amplifier and instrument. Now, as you might imagine, the way that we test filters is by using a network analyzer. We inject signals into the filter at different frequencies and then measure how much those signals were attenuated when they come out of the other side, so to speak. Uh, for the network analyzer folks out there, this is an S11 or S21 measurement. What we're most interested in is the amount of attenuation over the frequency range of interest. How much are signals attenuated outside of the pass band, in the case of a bandpass filter, for example. Additional parameters of interest include how steep the skirts of the filter are and how flat the frequency response is. In other words, how much variation is there both inside and outside of the pass band. A perfect filter would look like a box with a flat top and completely vertical sides. But these kinds of filters aren't really practical or even possible in many cases. For tunable filters, that is filters whose pass band can be adjusted, it's also, also worth checking that the, res the response at different frequencies. Most tunable filters don't maintain exactly the same filter shape when you tune them over their entire operating range. I'll end this slide on a somewhat practical note. I, I know people who use base station filters when doing field work. Uh, that is the actual filters taken out of a base station that would normally be installed at a base station. Uh, these filters are usually pretty good filters, and of course, for network operators, they're usually easily available. They tend to be somewhat large physically. Um, a tunable filter, such as the one in the picture here, provides some flexibility in terms of frequency if you have to look at multiple bands. Fixed OEM type filters, um, smaller, usually have good bandpass characteristics and are lower size and lower cost. Um, all of these are practical considerations when you're working in the field. I'd like to switch now to a discussion of RF measurements. Once the base station is up and running, and we're often interested in several parameters of the base station, including things such as the total channel power, the occupied bandwidth, et cetera. And what we're doing here is measuring the signals actually produced by the base station hardware. We're not generating signals with our instruments or test equipment, as we were in the case of the previous measurements that we were looking at. There are a number of parameters that are useful as both measurements of base station performance as well as what I'm going to call sanity checks to make sure the base station is operating properly and is operating within its assigned spectral limits. Some of the more important measurements are things such as occupied bandwidth, channel power, etc. We'll discuss some of these in a few slides, but these are basically measurements where the results are expressed in terms such as hertz and dB. The next level up, so to speak, is where we measure not just the power and the bandwidth of the signal, but the actual contents of the signal themselves. And this is what we refer to as demodulation. When we demodulate the base station signals, we get information about specific base station parameters. For example, uh, in the case of LTE, we'd like to know things such as what is a cell ID? What are the levels of various physical or logical channels, such as primary, secondary, sync, PBCH, et cetera? And even things such as a distribution of modulation and coding schemes in the transmitted signals. Uh, what I mean by this is what percentage of our resource blocks in LTE are being sent as QPSK versus 16 QAM versus 64 QAM, et cetera? Again, it bears repeating that what I'm calling RF measurements, in this case, are passive measurements. 
we use a spectrum analyzer to examine the live signals from the base station. We're not generating any signals as we were in the previous uh, section. In some cases, we make these in measurements by connecting directly to the base station, a so-called conducted measurement. And in other cases, we make these measurements OTA or over the air using an antenna. Naturally, since we're normally doing these kind of measurements in the field, we would prefer to use a portable instrument to do these measurements. And these instruments must also be network aware as we'll see in some of the upcoming slides. Let's start by looking at two of the most common RF measurements, namely occupied bandwidth and channel power. As everybody here is aware, spectrum is a finite resource. You can't create additional spectrum. So as demand for wireless services increased, there's been an ever greater demand for spectrum and more and more people are using spectrum and wanting to use spectrum. From a technical and regulatory point of view, one of the first things that should be checked when making RF measurements of base station signals is whether or not the signal's within its allocated spectrum range. And this is what we normally do using a so-called occupied bandwidth measurement. How wide of a bandwidth is our signal occupying? Occupied bandwidth. We normally define occupied bandwidth as a frequency range that contains 99% of the signal's total power. Note that this is 99% is often explicitly defined in the relative standards. Uh, for you standards junkies, this is uh, section 661 of TS-136 and LTE. Now, since what we're measuring is bandwidth, we would expect the result of our measurement would be expressed in terms of hertz, or the width of the signal. Keep in mind that we're only interested here in how wide the signal is, not the absolute power of the signal, its modulation, or other parameters of the signal. Although we normally expect that we'd be making occupied bandwidth measurements of our base station signals, I have seen people who make occupied bandwidth measurements of unknown or often interfering signals in order to try to identify these interfering signals based on the width of those signals. Uh, granted, one could also use markers or just eyeball the unknown signal to make a, a rough estimate of its spectral width, but you should get more precise measurements than when you do a proper occupied bandwidth measurement. Here we see an example of an occupied bandwidth measurement. Uh, the signal in this case is an LTE downlink signal. It's 10 megahertz wide. And we're using the standard LTE definition where occupied bandwidth is defined as 99% of the total signal power. The result we obtain here is approximately 8.9 megahertz, which is actually normal. There's a slight guard band on either side for this particular downlink signal. Uh, the blue lines in the display, the screenshot, indicate the upper and lower limits. And again, this is a measurement that we would make using typically a portable spectrum analyzer, either directly connected to the base station or as an over-the-air type measurement. Here we have another example of an occupied bandwidth measurement. Same LTE downlink signal, also 10 megahertz wide, or supposed to be 10 megahertz wide. And again, we're using the standard LTE definition, where occupied bandwidth is defined as 99% of the total signal power. However, in this case, the result we obtain is approximately 10.79 megahertz. This is definitely not normal and would warrant immediate investigation since first the signal exceeds the spectrum allocated to it. Um, the reason this could be important is besides just simply spilling out into other spectrum is it probably indicates a problem with the base, st base station, for example, a faulty filter or an amplifier that's being overdriven. Again, making these kind of measurements using a tool such as a portable spectrum analyzer can give you insights into how the base station is performing. Now, in occupied bandwidth measurements, we were concerned with measuring how wide the signal was, over what frequency range it extended, how many hertz wide it was. But we weren't interested in how much power there was, or we weren't measuring anyway, how much power there was over this frequency range. The signal could have been very weak, could have been smoking hot. We really don't know. That wasn't the measurement we were making. In channel power measurements, we define what the signal bandwidth is, and then we measure how much power is contained within that channel. It pretty much goes without saying that coverage of a particular base station is very strongly correlated with the amount of power that it transmits. I should probably qualify that and say that it's really, more is not always better when it comes to power. But in any case, we, we would definitely like to know how much total power is being transmitted by our base station. And this is precisely what a channel power measurement gives us. And since we're making a power level measurement, our results will be expressed in DVM typically. Um, is it possible to measure the total channel power without making a proper channel power measurement? Well, um, there are some ways that channel power can be estimated by making a power measurement at one point in the carrier and then extrapolating the total amount of power found over the entire carrier given the width of the carrier. But quite honestly, even assuming that you can make a good single point measurement and assuming you can do the math correctly, this really isn't a proper channel power measurement. 
And the good news is that a good handheld spectrum analyzer makes it very easy to get an accurate and precise channel power measurement. We'll see an example of this on the next slide. Again, here we're looking at an LTE downlink signal, again, 10 megahertz wide. How do we know that we're looking at a signal that's 10 megahertz wide? Well, recall that for channel power measurements, we actually have to manually define how wide the channel is, define how wide it is, since this is the bandwidth over which we're going to sum up the power, over which we're going to integrate, so to speak. Um, in this screenshot, we see that the overall channel power is 9 is 45.7 dBm, which you should note is different from the level measured at a particular point. Uh, just pick one at random, see NIC 65 dBm. Again, although there are some ways that a rough approximation of channel power can be calculated from that particular point value, a portable spectrum analyzer normally will have the ability to measure the channel power directly and therefore will be give you a much more accurate representation of what the base station signal really is in terms of power. And as we all know, the whole idea behind wireless communication is that we impose information on a signal. We modulate it. And then we retrieve that information from the signal at the other end. We demodulate it. However, in terms of testing and troubleshooting mobile networks, it's not the user data, the web pages, the videos, et cetera, that we're interested in. What we mean here by demodulation is decoding some of the information, the control information being sent by the base station and that's used for operation of the mobile network. For example, we might be interested in the cell ID, what the cell ID is for a particular base station. This can help us determine if we're looking at the proper signal or if the base station cell ID is configured correctly. We may want to know what the individual powers of various channels are, since it's really these powers that define the cell radius. We may also want to look for imperfections or faults in the actual transmitted signal, such as examining the EVM or error vector magnitude signals. None of these can be measured using the standard RF type measurements we, that we just discussed. And this is the reason why we talk about demodulating the base station signals. It goes far beyond a standard RF level type measurement. Demodulation is a functionality built into portable spectrum analyzers and can be done either directly attached to a base station or OTA over the air. Obviously, if we're directly attached to a base station, we know, or at least we think we know, what base station we're connected to. Whereas in the case of over-the-air measurements, we normally need to select the particular base station whose signals we'd like to demodulate. I'd like to stress here again that when we do demodulation measurements, we're only looking at the signals from a single particular base station. Compare this to, say, an over-the-air channel power measurement. At any given location in the field, we hopefully will be receiving downlink signals from a number of different base stations. And our channel power measurement will be the combination, the sum of all those power measurements, again, assuming an over-the-air measurement. For demodulation, we pick the base station whose parameters we'd like to measure and essentially ignore all the other ones. Demodulation also doesn't neatly fit into our previous categories of installation, operation, coverage, and troubleshooting because, frankly, it's a useful tool in many different phases of mobile network operation. For example, we do demodulation measurements when we turn a base station up for the first time during routine maintenance, during coverage performance modifications, and it's, it's also a useful first step in troubleshooting. Now, there are many different ways of presenting and analyzing the information provided by a typical demodulation measurement. Let's take a look at some of the more common examples on the next few slides. As I mentioned earlier, demodulation of mobile network signals using a portable spectrum analyzer is an interesting case, since some of the information we get from demodulation overlaps with the information that we might get from other tools as well. Uh, here we see one result from an LTE demodulation measurement, namely a scan showing the e-node beads that are visible at this geographic location. Obviously, this is an over-the-air type measurement, and we can see the different cell IDs, each corresponding to a different cell or rather sector, as well as other things such as the sync power. We could, of course, get the same kind of information from, say, a drive test scanner, a tool we'll discuss shortly. But the advantage to having this type of demodulation-based information on a portable spectrum analyzer is that it gives a quick coverage type overview without requiring a second, often more complex, measurement system. Measurements such as these show us what base stations are visible and at what powers without requiring the complexity and cost of, say, a traditional drive or coverage test system. When we're looking at a base station signal or we're looking at the RF, again, I mentioned before, we're looking at the downlink signal as a single monolithic signal occupying a certain frequency range, the occupied bandwidth, and containing a certain amount of RF energy, the channel power. Uh, this is, of course, an extremely high-level way of measuring a base station signal. Base station signals consist of physical and logical channels that convey different types of information, and each one of these channels can have its own power level, its own EVM, its own error vector magnitude, etc. 
In addition, the modulation encoding scheme used on each of these channels, as well as on the individual user allocations, uh, can vary, as in the case of LTE, where there are three different types of modulation encoding schemes, namely QPSK, 16-QAM, and 64-QAM. If we use a spectrum analyzer that's capable of demodulation, this allows precise examination of the different power levels in EVM for the different physical and logical channels. It also provides information about the distribution of modulation types. This latter figure is actually more important than it may seem. Um, it determines, it helps, it's helpful in determining base station efficiency. Ideally, we'd like to have as much higher order modulation as possible, for example, 64 qualm, since this will tend to give us best, the best levels of throughput. A base station operating, an LTE base station operating mostly at QPSK would be a cause for concern, either because something is incorrectly configured in the base station or because the RF conditions are so poor that we can only use the lowest order modulation reliably. Again, the ability to obtain this type of information requires that we use instruments, such as portable spectrum analyzers, that are capable of cellular signal demodulation. Let's move on now and talk about what I'm calling coverage measurements. Uh, when I did these kind of presentations several years ago, actually it's been more than several, but several years ago, I would call this a drive test. But over the last couple of years, I made a real effort to move away from calling this drive test. Why? Well, frankly, because we're seeing a significant migration in the cellular world away from large towers or large antennas, the traditional macro cell site with a big footprint. And we're instead moving towards smaller cells, indoor coverage, things like distributed antenna systems, DAS, et cetera. And obviously nobody drives a car around inside of a concert hall or a hospital in order to measure coverage. So for the most part, we're still measuring the same kinds of things, but now more often than not, at least in my personal experience, we're doing it on foot, and that's why I'm trying to call this coverage measurements instead of drive test measurements. That said, there are some other differences between traditional drive tests and the way that coverage measurements are made today. Uh, for example, there are many, many more bands and technologies than there used to be. I may have a network that consists now of GSM, UMTS, and LTE, various permutations of these, Edge, HSPA+. New bands seem to pop up on a regular basis, both as a result of spectrum refarming and reallocation of bands from one technology to another. Uh, one of the more recent enhancements to LTE, carrier aggregation, uh, further complicates this multiple band issue. So instead of the good old days where you could just test GSM on 850 and 1900 and be done, um, again, as I might have done, say, 10 years ago, I'm now testing GSM, UMTS, LTE on half a dozen bands, and this begs the question, how do we most effectively test them all? The other area in coverage measurements that's been gaining in importance over the last few years is the variation in performance that we see based not on the network itself, that is the base stations, but also variation in, in performance based on the UE, the phone, the RF environment, et cetera. Performance is a function of many, many more things than it used to be. And this has also changed our requirements in terms of tools and techniques for making coverage measurements. Let's look at this more in a bit more detail on the next slide. There are two main types of tools that are used in coverage measurement. There's scanners and UEs or mobiles as people call them. The main difference between these two classes of tools is the former scanners are completely passive. They simply measure the RF environment and base station signals and report the results. Whereas UEs or mobiles are active participants in the network. We'll talk about both of these in a good deal more detail in the next few slides. Uh, for now, let's suffice it to say that we typically would like to use both scanners and UEs or mobiles if possible. Notice that I've been intentionally vague with regards to what constitutes coverage. Again, is coverage simply being able to get a signal at all? Is it the level of the signal? Is it the data throughput or the voice quality that I receive? There's really no right answer here since all of these measurements are relative. Um, but I'm going to say that my personal feeling is that the closer our measurements are to the end user experience, uh, such as measuring voice quality or data throughput, the better. So I tend to place a greater emphasis on the end result than on the lower layer measurements when at all possible. With all these technologies and bands, as well as a plethora of devices, we often need to make multiple measurements. For example, I, I want to test LTE throughput at both 700 megahertz and at AWS, or I want to benchmark four different kinds of devices to see which one gets the best throughput, hands over the least number of times, et cetera. In order to get valid, accurate results, multiple measurements should be made simultaneously whenever possible. But this means that instead of walking the floor of a hospital at 700 megahertz, then walking it again at AWS, I should make every effort to walk it with two devices or more devices operating in parallel, say one on each band. This also has practical advantages in terms of save time, effort, hassle, especially for localities where making multiple drives or walks may be logistically difficult. 
And while post-processing has always been and continues to be a very popular way of studying coverage data, especially data collected from multiple mobiles, it's important to have a way to look at the results of multiple devices in real time to identify any potential issues and to quickly rerun tests if you need to. Uh, I've personally had several occasions where we were planning to test performance on two different bands, only to find out that one of the bands wasn't actually there. And lastly, although we usually think of coverage measurement as being something we do with our own network, there are certainly many reasons to analyze one's competitors' networks as well. It never hurts to know how good or bad the competition is. Now, as mentioned before, scanners are completely passive instruments. They don't generate any RF signals and are not active participants in the network, so to speak. What this means is that scanners can measure a wide variety of base station signals and other parameters relating to the RF environment. But they can't measure things that require active participation in the network, things such as throughput or voice quality or handovers, because they're passive. They're not actually in a call. The scanners themselves are normally relatively small devices. Does anybody actually say small within a bread box anymore? But um, they tend to be small devices with an antenna and GPS connectors, and the devices are controlled via an attached laptop or tablet. And because they're based on dedicated hardware, scanners also have several advantages over UEs. The first of these is just raw performance. Scanners can make measurements very quickly on multiple bands simultaneously. Higher end scanners are also not band limited, so they can be used on any arbitrary frequency ranges instead of being tied to a single or a small number of standard frequency bands. Uh, this is important when you're trying to minimize the number of measurement passes, as we mentioned on the previous slide. Scanners also provide a great deal of detailed information, very detailed information, regarding the network and its parameters. In addition to identifying base stations, scanners can do things like decode system information, MIBs and SIBs, automatically determine the geographical position of base stations, compute quality parameters such as RSRP, RSRQ, etc. Modern scanners can also provide things like rank indication, which gives the network planner or optimizer information regarding the effectiveness of MIMO in a given, given area. And uh, lastly, just as portable spectrum analyzers can be used for some scanner type functions, scanners can also perform some basic spectrum type measurements, such as displaying raw spectrum and normal and waterfall type displays. This can be in, uh, useful when looking for interference as well. One of the challenges as in using a scanner is simply how to work with the sheer volume of information that a high performance scanner is capable of producing. Uh, fortunately, the user interfaces for scanners also tend to be highly customizable. So information is displayed as tables, charts, graphs, maps, et cetera, as, as needed or as the user configures it. For example, we might want to have a top end base stations in a given band, uh, both as a table and graphically as shown here. We might want to look at the results on a map, such as on the upper right for looking at received power as a color along a route track or base station locations as blue circles in this diagram. Uh, we can also look at several regions of spectrum or raw RF to see what the general RF conditions are like, things like noise floor interferes, as well as to determine if base stations are even present in the frequency ranges of interest. I have sometimes driven around for a long period of time without realizing you couldn't actually see the base station there. Now the other half of coverage measurement tasks has to do with mobiles or UEs, user equipment, as many people, or at least I call them. Unlike the passive but high performance scanners that we looked at on the last few slides, UEs are active participants in the network. They make and receive calls. They send and receive data and text the same way that a real device is, well, because they're real devices. Uh, typically these are commercially available devices with special firmware and software on them that allows them to make specialized measurements and collect user-defined active tests. The big benefit of UEs over scanners is their very ability to be an active participant in the network. Uh, these devices can, however, also make some network type measurements. For example, things like RSRP, RSRQ, downlink levels, allocation of coding schemes, etc. cetera. Uh, some devices even have the ability to read and decode system information, layer three signaling, in the same way that most drive test, I'm sorry, coverage scanners can. Uh, they also can report on other base stations within the same bands, neighbors, and maybe provide some indication of overall RF conditions. But again, the main strength of a UE in testing mobile networks is that they can measure the level of service that would be presented to an actual subscriber because again, they are active participants in the network. Um, being relatively small and battery powered, UEs also lend themselves well to simultaneous measurements. You can, for example, put half a dozen of them into a backpack, perhaps each configured on a different band, different technology, et cetera, and then use some kind of external controller like a tablet to synchronize and control them. And like the data produced by scanners, the data produced by UEs is often post-processed using commercial tools. Um, one last note, we've seen substantial variation in end user performance when it comes to comparing one particular UE versus another. Benchmarking different UEs against each other has actually become a kind of a popular way to analyze and troubleshoot performance issues that are actually based more on the UE 
than on the network itself. Um, here's some examples. In the case of scanners, the UE can provide a large amount of data to the user, both in terms of the network and in terms of active test results. Um, although a UE can simply be placed into idle mode and you can measure the network parameters, the real interest right, in using a UE-based UE or in UE based testing usually comes from the ability to measure things such as voice quality, data throughput, etc. Things that a passive scanner can't do. Of course, these can be correlated to network based measurements. For example, we can plot our voice quality, MOS equivalents maybe, and RTP jitter when we're testing the quality of a Volte network. Um, both indoor and outdoor mapping of results also can help us better understand the interplay of network and UE. Um, one point I'd also like to make is we shouldn't ignore the human aspect. For example, in the example here of MOS voice quality on the right, we see an average score of 3.1, which is acceptable by most cellular standards, but it varies between 4 and 1.75. Like many other things, consistency is important when it comes to performance. Most users prefer uh, consistently mediocre quality over quality that goes between great and awful. So being able to run trend tests will give us additional information that we might not get from a simple numerical average. This brings us to our last phase in mobile network operation, namely interference hunting. Even the best designed, installed, and maintained network can suffer severe performance degradation or even complete failure if external interference is present. Uh, we've presented on this topic many times over the last few years, especially since interference has shown itself to be a significant issue in LTE networks compared to previous versions of network technologies. And the introduction of new services such as Volte means that the importance of interference will continue to increase over the next few years. Although there are rare cases where we can identify and resolve interference without actually having to go outside, in almost all cases, the only way to resolve interference is to hunt it down, a process called, surprisingly, interference hunting. Uh, we typically try to do some analysis of the interfere, if possible, to determine where it is coming from. But typically, interference hunting involves some kind of direction finding a radio location to find the physical source of the interfere. In my experience, interference hunting can be divided into three general stages. The first is the identifying the general area where interference is affecting our network. Uh, fortunately, as network operators, we usually have a very good idea of where the interferer is. It's in the sector reporting interference. Uh, interference can be detected in a number of ways, such as high RSSI, poor KPIs, like high number of call drops, etc. Um, I'd like to say at this point, again, in my experience, poor throughput by itself is not really a reliable indicator of interference. Uh, many cases of poor throughput have nothing whatsoever to do with the RF environment. In any case, the uh, first stage normally gets us down to within a few kilometers, typically the footprint of the affected sector or sectors. In the next stage, we drive around the sector. There's no advantage in driving over walking. It's just more efficient to cover a larger area in a car. Uh, here we tend to use vehicle-mounted antennas or dedicated direction finding systems to narrow the location down to about 100 meters or so. Uh, when we think we're within walkable distance, we then start the walking around phase. At this point, we scan or sweep with a handheld antenna and a portable receiver or spectrum analyzer and try to determine the precise location of where the interference signal is or where the interfering signal is coming from. So let's talk a little bit more about the different tools and techniques we use in this phase. There are two main categories of handheld instruments used in interference hunting, monitoring receivers and spectrum analyzers. Uh, externally, these instruments may tend to look the same, but there's a fundamental internal difference between them that affect how they're used. Um, as I mentioned a couple of slides back, the majority of interference hunting activities involve some level of driving around. Um, there's the old tried and true driving around with an antenna pointed out of the window methodology. Um, but there's a migration in recent years towards using specialized high performance direction finding systems. Um, these significantly reduce the time needed to find an interferer, as well as increase the probability of locating difficult targets, such as intermittent signals. Uh, antennas also play an important part in interference hunting, uh, both on vehicles and during the walking around phase. Handheld antennas come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. What's most important is having an antenna that covers the frequency range of interest, which has good directionality but low side lobes. And again, there's typically a trade-off here as well. And lastly, there's some other accessories that can come in handy, things like filters and LNAs, and some that are less obvious, like binoculars and bug spray. Now, let's talk about the difference between monitoring receivers and spectrum analyzers. The biggest difference between FFT-based monitoring receivers and swept, uh, swept spectrum analyzers is speed. Uh, without going into too much internal technical details, receivers use a FFT-based architecture and are substantially faster than spectrum analyzers. Uh, that are based on a swept or heterodyne based architecture. Um, if you see the two instruments side by side, you'll know exactly what I mean by that. Um, why is this important? Well, some people say that it's important because you want to catch a very short duration signals. And this is true in a sense. 
an interferer that's on the air for 10 milliseconds every second is really not much of an interferer. On the other hand, there are many cases in which the interferer is constant or nearly constant, but while you're driving around, you can only see it for a fraction of a second as you drive past it. And this is where speed becomes very critical when you're doing interference hunting, and the speed of the instrument plays a significant role. Now, why would anyone ever want to use a portable spectrum analyzer, which tends to be slower than a monitoring receiver? Well, monitoring receivers are typically do not do normal RF measurements, like occupied bandwidth. And portable spectrum analyzers tend to be more of a Swiss Army knife type of instrument. So if you do a lot of interference hunting, a higher power monitoring receiver makes a lot of sense. If you have more general responsibilities or perhaps a more limited budget, a portable spectrum analyzer is usually a better choice. Um, automated direction finding systems are also used to be are part of interference hunting that used to be almost exclusively used by military or government type or organizations. I say automatic because they require almost no user intervention. You simply enter the target frequency, perhaps a few parameters, hit the go button, and the system determines the location of the transmitter. Uh, true direction finding sy systems are bearing based. That is, they compute lines of bearing toward the target and then use a mathematical algorithm to compute the location. This requires special antennas and processing tools, but provides excellent, and I do mean excellent, accuracy in almost all environments. Uh, this includes urban settings with high levels of multipath. It's important here to distinguish a true direction finding system from one which simply guesses at locations based on received power. Since power level based systems tend to be very unreliable, and in my experience, they add little to no value over simply driving around and manually looking at the level. I'd like to conclude with a few general observations and maybe even make a few predictions about techniques and tools used for mobile network testing. Uh, the first is probably the most important of all. Even the best tools don't solve problems if they're hard to use or if the users of these tools don't receive the proper training and support. Although there have been a lot of really great improvements in GUI design, automation, etc., the truth of the matter is that the human element often has the greatest impact on how useful an instrument is in the field. Note that training and support are not simply one-time events. Ongoing training is vital to keep up skills and to keep effectiveness at its peak. The next point is that uh, we've seen how some tools, such as portable spectrum analyzers and coverage set systems and monitoring receivers, they may all overlap in some functionality. But a one-size-fits-all or better everything under one handle type instrument usually is neither practical nor desirable for several reasons. The first is simply cost. Most of us don't need an instrument that can do everything. And it makes little sense to pay for and lug around an instrument that purports to be all things to all people. Um, for those of us who do have to carry instruments around, one, the continuing decrease in size and weight is certainly very welcome, and lower cost appeals to management as well. But like most things, one does tend to get what one pays for when it comes to instruments. Uh, we should be very careful here not to try to make our lives more difficult by trying to make do with tools that aren't sufficient for the task at hand. Uh, again, although we've seen great improvements in terms of decreases in cost and size, there are certain finite lower limits in terms of what's required to have a decent performance instrument. Uh, my final point is that unlike, or maybe not unlike, many other areas in engineer, engineering and technology, there's an awful lot of what I like to call tribal knowledge out there. Learning how to test and troubleshoot mobile networks is not something that can be easily learned from a book or from a class. It's really something that's learned by doing. There are many network engineers and technicians who have accumulated really vast amounts of knowledge with regards to how to use different tools and techniques to troubleshoot networks. And this network was intended to be a very modest attempt to make our contribution to this knowledge base and to encourage everyone to share what they've learned as well. Uh, that brings us to the end of the slide portion of our presentation. Um, we may still have some time for Q&A at this point. Uh, Kyle? Yeah, Paul, thanks uh, for a great presentation there. Uh, I think we have time for just two questions. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, of course, if anyone has any questions uh, they'd like to ask, please submit them, uh, and these will be shared with Paul for after the webinar. Um, so first one, what is the average division of time in mobile network troubleshooting, i.e. between tasks? Ooh, that's a tough question because it changes. Typically, at the very beginning, when you're turning up a base station, obviously most of your time is going to be sent, spent troubleshooting the base station. Well, in my experience, the initial testing, the, the site installation and maintenance, is, of course, a very high percentage at the beginning, but drops off to very low towards the end. Uh, most of the time, I would say, is evenly split between coverage measurements and interference hunting, uh, every now and then with some RF when need be. But traditionally, I would say once the, the base station is up and running and has subscribers on it, it switches almost exclusively and probably about 50-50 to coverage versus interference hunting, maybe two-thirds or three-quarters coverage depending on your particular environment. All right, thanks. And, and I think we have time for just one more question. So uh, what are some good resources that you know of for learning more about interference hunting? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's a great question for me. Um, we have a Rodian Schwartz has a microsite uh, for interference hunting where we have a number of videos and webinars and white papers, etc. Uh, as I mentioned on the last slide, one of the challenges that I find and one of the reasons that we at Rodian Schwartz do these webinars is you really can't go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and buy a book on interference hunting. It's something that's often learned by doing or learned from working with other people who've done it. And so I would highly recommend if you are interested in interference hunting, uh, please do visit our website. Google is also your friend. And to talk to people who do it. Again, there's a lot of tribal knowledge out there, and, and people are often very willing to share. And that is, at least in my experience, really the best way to learn about interference hunting. All right, great. I want to thank everyone today for attending the webinar. Uh, an introduction to tools and techniques for mobile network testing, presented by Rody and Schwartz. Again, our presenter today was Paul Denisowski, Applications Engineer at Rodian Shores. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, everyone.